So I'm going to begin, of course, with Albert Einstein. 1915, he told us that space and time are warped by mass and by energy. And uh, in 1916, he used his general theory of relativity, which described and predicted that warping, to also predict the ex existence of gravitational waves. Gravitational waves, Einstein described in the following way, or this is a more modern description, but ba the basically the idea was there in his 1916 paper, that if you were to take out in space, not on the surface of the Earth where you're fighting with gravity, but out in space, uh, take a network of freely falling particles, set all these particles at rest with respect to each other. If there are no gravitational waves, they'll remain at rest with respect to each other. When a gravitational wave comes by, they'll be stretched apart horizontally, squeezed together vertically, and that stretch and squeeze will oscillate because inertial reference frames that are separated from each other move back and forth relative to each other. In effect, space is stretched and squeezed in this kind of a pattern by the gravitational wave. That's the manifestation of the wave. Uh, Einstein said in his classic 1916 paper that the waves would be so weak that they would probably never be detectable. Uh, but Joseph Weber, about 50 years later at the University of Maryland, set out to detect them devised a gravitational wave detector that could have ultimately succeeded if it had continued to be pursued and not been superseded by a different design and laid the foundations for our field. Uh, wh what had changed? New technology, lasers, modern computers, for example, and a deeper understanding of possible sources of gravitational waves, things Einstein had never dreamed of, colliding black holes, colliding neutron stars, aspect of the birth of the universe. And so, uh, Joe Weber is regarded as the founder of our field, and, by 19, and, and he inspired me and many others who work in the field. Uh, by 1972, I and my theorist colleagues at Caltech and elsewhere had begun to develop a vision for what we might do with gravitational waves if they could be detected. The key point is that uh, the prediction is that there are only two types of waves that can propagate across the universe, bringing us information about what's very far away electromagnetic waves, which is what, of course, Galileo used to create modern astronomy. My point is, telescope to the sky and discovering the four moons of Jupiter. And gravitational waves, which LIGO has done the same thing as Galileo did to create uh, modern gravitational astronomy by pointing our telescopes at the sky and discovering colliding black holes, which is where I'm going with this talk. Uh, by 1972, it was clear uh, to us that there was enormous contrast between these two types of waves. Electromagnetic waves are oscillations of the electromagnetic field that propagate through space-time, while as gravitational waves are oscillations of the fabric or the geometry of space-time itself. Electromagnetic waves are incoherent superpositions of emission from particles and atoms and molecules, almost always in astronomy whereas gravitational waves are emitted coherently by the bulk motion of uh, matter, that is, of mass and of energy. Electromagnetic waves are all too easily absorbed and scattered by matter. Gravitational waves are never significantly absorbed or scattered, even near the Planck era at the beginning of the universe. The contrast between the two is so enormous that it, became o it was obvious to us in the early 1970s that many gravitational wave sources would never be seen electromagnetically and so huge surprises were likely, but also that there would be sources that we would see, such as colliding neutron stars, uh, where we would get both gravitational and electromagnetic waves and have a tremendous new insights by combining these uh, ty uh, two types of observations. And so in 1972, at the same time as uh, I and my colleagues were, had developed this vision uh, for what we might do with this, Ray Weiss at MIT wrote a paper in which he basically laid out the design of a gravitational wave detector of a sort quite different from Weber's, uh, in which you would have four mirrors that hang from overhead supports. As the gravitational wave comes by, it pushes these mirrors apart, pushes those together. The next half cycle pushes these apart, pushes those together. And you lose the technique of laser interferometry to monitor that changing uh, difference distances between those mirrors. Uh, in his pa classic paper, Ray Weiss identified all the major noise sources that this kind of a gravitational wave detector would have to face and identified ways to deal with them, computed what the expected sensitivity would be, 
and comparing with the source strengths that were being predicted by me and my colleagues, uh, concluded that if you had a detector a few kilometers in size, you might succeed. I was skeptical. Let's look at some numbers. The prediction is that if you had mirrors that are separated by, say, 10 kilometers, uh, then the motions between them would be 10 to the minus 15 centimeters. And how big is 10 to the minus 15 centimeters? Well, you begin with one centimeter. You divide by 100, you get the thickness of a human hair. Divide by 100 again, you get the wavelength of the light that's used to do this, one micron. Divide by 10,000, you get the diameter of an atom. Divide by 100,000, you get the diameter of the nucleus of an atom. Divide by 100, and you get the size of those motions. <laughs> that was my reaction, precisely my reaction. <laughs> So it took about four years for Ray Weiss and, uh, and other colleagues, particularly Vlad Vladimir Braginsky in Moscow, to convince me that this just might succeed. And once I was convinced, I decided that as I, as a theorist, should uh, make every effort that I and my research group could do to help them succeed. And so in 1978, we decided to build a gravitational wave experimental group at Caltech to work in parallel with Ray Weiss's group we brought Ronald Reaver from Glasgow to lead that effort because he'd made some very clever and significant improvements on Ray Weiss's designs. Uh, 90, 80 to 83 at Caltech, under Dreaver's and Stan Whitcomb's leadership, a 40-meter prototype, 1%, 1 percent, 1 one-hundredth the scale of the ultimate LIGO gravitational wave detectors, was set up, built, and began to operate. At MIT, Ray Weiss completed the construction of a smaller prototype, prototype but more importantly, he carried out a, led a feasibility study for kilometer scale interferometers uh, and concluded that it was feasible to build these things, uh, economically feasible, technically feasible. So in 1984, MIT with Ray Weiss, Caltech with Ron Drever and I, uh, created the LIGO project in uh, collusion, collaboration with the National Science Foundation. And the person who really should be regarded as the fourth founder of LIGO Richard Isaacson, who himself had made major contributions to the theory of gravitational waves and was a real person in Washington who made this thing happen. Uh, we, uh, a committee in 1986, uh, November of 1986, that was triggered, the existence of the, of the committee was triggered by uh, Dick Garwin here. Uh, this committee looked at uh, what we were doing and said, you're crazy. You can't run a project with a Drever, Weiss, and Thorne trying to run it. You're a dysfunctional leadership. <laughs> uh, you have to have a real director who has ultimate control and uh, makes the ultimate decisions. And so we brought on Robbie Volk, who had been the first chief scientist at JPL and uh, had been the provost at Caltech. He led us in 1989 through the writing of a superb construction proposal in which we said we would first build the facilities to house these, house these interferometers two facilities at two different locations on the, uh, in the United States. Then we would build an initial set of interferometers that would probably not see anything, because they wouldn't be sensitive enough. But if we were lucky, we would see something. And then we would build advanced interferometers based on what we had learned from the initial interferometers that would have a high probability of success. Now, needless to say, this is kind of hard to get funded. You're going to build an astronomical facility that uh, wasn't going to see anything, and then you're going to improve it. <laughs> and so it took us a while, to 1992, to get the first congressional funding. Robbie Volk led us through that whole process. But once NSF had bought in and Congress had bought in, we were back completely with uh, no major cuts in funding by the NSF and by the Congress, regardless of who was in power in Washington, the Democrats or the Republicans, from then until today. And it's a remarkable tribute to NSF and to Congress that they backed this uh, through two generations of interferometers, as we had said would be necessary. And we brought Don Barry Barris as our second director in 1994 because he had major experience in leading large projects. In fact, in my view, he is the most uh, the most effective leader of large science projects, at least large physics projects, that uh, the world has ever seen. He, uh, expand, he led us in construction of the facilities. He expanded LIGO to other institutions, now a 1,000 scientists and engineers at about 80 or 90 institutions in 16 nations. It was necessary to have this much larger collaboration in order to pull this off. 
because these instruments are so complex and there's so many different things that can go wrong that you just couldn't pull it off for the small scale teams that could be put together just at Caltech and MIT. He led us in the construction of the initial interferometers and the earliest uh, uh, observations with them. And then uh, in the later observations and in the installation of the advanced interferometers, we were led by two other uh, directors, Jay Marks and David Wright, he, because Barry was stolen by the Hanergy physicists to go back and lead the study for the next large uh, uh, colli super collider that followed after uh, the L LHC in, in uh, Geneva. In parallel with all of this effort, uh, another 40-year effort was going on on computer simulations for gravitational wave sources, especially the merger of binary black holes. And in fact, I left LIGO in terms of day-to-day -day involvement about 2001, right after we wrote uh, the science case for ad the advanced detectors in order to spearhead the construction, the building of, of a research group working on source simulation. So I did not play a significant role in the ultimate detection. It was really the superb LIGO team that Barry Barish had put together that pulled it off in the end. But the computer simulations were really quite important because the first thing we saw was the collision of two black holes, a binary black hole system, in 14 September 2015. Here is a simulation of that from one of these computer simulations by the Caltech Cornell collaboration, the so-called SXS collaboration. Uh, the key point is that black holes are made from a warpage of space and time. So this depicts that warping as you would see it from a higher dimension looking in on our universe. Just look at the equi at the orbital plane of the two black holes. Each black hole looks like basically a funnel going down. The horizon of the black hole is down inside here. The color coding shows the slowing of time. The shape of this surface is the warping of space, and the arrows show the dragging of space into motion or dragging of inertial frames as uh, the two black holes go around each other. And here is what happened to produce the first burst of gravitational waves that we saw. We go into slow motion. This is 0.1017, seconds before the merger. The warping of space becomes enormous, like in a huge storm at sea, a giant splashing wave, a uh, slow, slowing of time, time in this red region, an oscillation, the gravitational waves go traveling out. And the amount of power, the first the amount of energy that came off in that collision was what you would get by annihilating three suns and turning it all into energy, putting it all into gravitational waves. And it came off in roughly a tenth of a second, uh, during which time the total power output, the energy per unit time, was 50 times larger than the power output in light from all the stars in the universe put together. 50 universe luminosities during a brief period of about a tenth of a second uh, that uh, is all going into gravitational waves. No electromagnetic waves were seen whatsoever. As predicted, objects, phenomena that you would, don't see electromagnetically, you only see gravitationally. It's interesting to look at, see what this look, would look like to your eyes if you're up close to this source of gravitational waves. Here is a star, the, and the light rays from this star can go in along this path to your camera, along that path to the camera, go in, go around that black hole to the camera, multiple images of each star, gravitational lensing. And so the pattern around the stars, as you would see with your eyes, is this. You see the black holes going around and around each other, uh, colliding, merging, produce their great burst of gravitational wave energy. The waves traveled outward from the galaxy in which they were born. This is 1.3 billion years ago when uh, multicell life was just forming on Earth. Traveled out through the galaxy in which they were born into intergalactic space, across intergalactic space, arrived at the outer edges of our Milky Way galaxy, 50,000 years ago, when our ancestors were sharing the Earth with the Neanderthals, entered our Milky Way galaxy, reached the Earth, 14 September 2015, touched down, touched up at the Antarctic Peninsula, traveled through the Earth, unscathed, and upward arrived, coming up uh, through the Earth at Livingston, Louisiana, at one of our two LIGO gravitational wave detectors, seven milliseconds later at the other one at Hanford, Washington. 
uh, here are the signals, the raw signals. They were surprisingly strong signals at uh, Livingston and at Hanford. This is the raw data, just band pass filtered to remove everything below 30 hertz and everything above 300 hertz and no other data processing. Uh, the data were analyzed with great care by a team of 1,000 members of the LIGO Scientific Collaboration, plus 250 members, roughly, of the Virgo Collaboration in Europe. Uh, and uh, the ultimate conclusion from that analysis was that, the, what did, uh, that was that the waveform, when cleaned up, would look like this. And this is a comparison with the numerical relativity simulations and the reconstructed uh, uh, signal is gray. Uh, the uh, simulation signal is red. The initial black holes were 29 solar masses and 36 solar masses for a total of 65 solar masses. The final black hole was 62 solar masses, three solar masses gone off in gravitational wave energy. Distance to the source was 1.3 billion light years. We only knew this with confidence and only knew these numbers with confidence because we compared with the numerical simulations, which were crucial. Because all, all of the signal that we got from that first source was from the collision and merger, which you cannot analyze by any technique except solving Einstein's equations on a big computer by numerical relativity. So these two efforts, this computational effort and the gravitational wave observation effort had to come together in this, uh, to make this first detection uh, fully understandable to extract the information from the sources. Of course, this made front page headlines in newspapers around the world. Uh, and it also very quickly became part of a widespread culture. This is a photograph uh, taken by Ray Weiss's uh, brother-in-law uh, in a subway uh, car uh, about two days after the discovery <laughs> in New York City. Scientists found gravitational waves in outer space if only it were that easy to find an apartment to, in New York City with a walk-in <laughs> closet. And the New Yorker, the day after the discovery, two birds, of course, the sound of the waves, if you put, if you put this on, in a, uh, on a loudspeaker, the sound of the waves is a chirp. Woo! So was that you I heard just now, or was it two black holes colliding? So this has become part of the widespread culture. By now, five black hole mergers have been announced by LIGO. There are more, uh, I'll tell you, uh, there are, will be more announced uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, and they have, this, this is the original one, these are the sizes of the two black holes. They are roughly 30 solar masses merged to form something, 65, uh, 63 solar masses. And then here's another pair, here's an another pair, another pair, another pair. So we're beginning to get statistics on black hole mergers. And we have seen one merger of two neutron stars, which I'll return to fairly quickly. And we have now been joined by the European Virgo gravitational wave detector, which gives us much better angular resolution on the sky. Talking about the future, we anticipate major improvements in LIGO sensitivity and Virgo sensitivity over the coming few years. By 2020, we should be at our design sensitivity and the event rate for black hole collision should be roughly one a day. It's now roughly one a month. In the late 2020s, we should be at about one per hour. By the late 2030s, we expect we'll see every black hole merger in the universe with masses below about 1,000 solar masses. Just as electromagnetic astronomy, radio astronomy, x-ray astronomy, uh, infrared astronomy, they've all blossomed and the, the rate of, uh, of New discoveries and improvement of technology has been enormous and just fabulous during my career. We anticipate the same thing with gravitational wave observations. By the time of events, LIGO set, uh, design sensitivity 2020, we expect we will see spinning neutron stars, pulsars, emitting continuous gravitational waves due to mountains on their surfaces, roughly speaking. We'll see black holes tear these neutron stars apart. Neutron stars with central densities around 10 times the density of an atomic nucleus, diameters of about 20 kilometers. Black holes tearing neutron stars apart. This uh, was, slide was made before our discovery of two neutron stars colliding. Neutron stars colliding in the collision, they o rip open the interior of the new neutron stars. This super dense nuclear matter opened up for the whole, the whole universe to see extremely hot, a burst of gamma rays 
And then as stuff spews out, ultimately light, x-rays, other forms of radiation. And so GW170817, that is the source discovered on August 17th, 2017, which has now been published, gravitational waves, a gamma ray burst 1.7 seconds after the neutron star collision seen by two different uh, uh, Earth orbiting satellites, uh, Fermi and Integral. Optical transient 11 hours after the neutron star collision. It uh, appears to be what's called a quillanova. Uh, you see the products of ra radioactive decay of gold, platinum, that is unstable elements of gold and platinum and other precious metals and heavy elements. Uh, it's now understood just from these observations that it's likely that a large fraction of the precious metals are created in our universe in neutron star collisions. Uh, X-rays first seen nine days after the neutron star collision, radio waves seen 16 days after the neutron star collision. Some relatively large fraction of the world's astronomers have observed this. This is one of the most uh, detailed studies of uh, any of uh, any object in the history of astronomy. We expect to see ultimately gravitational waves from the cores of supernovae, from phenomena at the birth of the universe called cosmic strings, and enormous surprises, and I can't tell you what they will be. <laughs> and finally, by the 2030s, we will have four different gravitational wave windows opened onto the universe. The first one at high frequencies, that is uh, short gravitational wave periods, uh, is LIGO and its partners, millisecond periods for gravitational waves. Least uh, space-based analog of LIGO will see gravitation, look for gravitational waves with periods of minutes to hours. Pulsar timing arrays, I won't go into the details of the technology, but this is basically uh, radio astronomers time the pulsars at different locations in the sky, and so when a gravitational wave sweeps over the Earth, it causes our clocks on Earth to speed up or slow down. And so all of the pulsars seem to slow down and speed up synchronously. Uh, and polarization of the cosmic microwave background, uh, looking at the patterns in the sky due to gravitational waves produced in the early universe uh, when the universe was billions of years old. Four different bands, frequency bands for gravitational waves. So as though you had opened up el optical electromagnetic, I'm sorry, optical infrared, ultraviolet, and radio astronomy uh, all in uh, a span of 20 years. By the 2030s, as the big payoff in my mind, we will be exploring the birth of the universe observationally and the birth of the fundamental forces. So the uh, future is very exciting. You just think of what has happened with electromagnetic astro astronomy since Galileo's time 400 years ago, and you can try to use your imagination for what will happen in the next 400 years here. Uh, I can only imagine 40 years into the future, not 400. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, the. Uh, the gravity wave reached us uh, 18 or 11 hours before the optical wave. Yeah. Is that movement faster than the speed of light? How do we understand the no. relative speeds of these waves propagating? So, so it's an issue of when can the enough light get out to be seen. This thing's very compact. Uh, the two, so the two neutron stars collide. They tear each other apart. Uh, and the first thing that is capable of getting out is the very, very high energy gamma rays uh, that are coming off this ultra-hot matter. And they arrive at Earth, uh, are seen at Earth, uh, I've forgotten, it's uh, 1.7 seconds uh, after the merger. So that's very quickly, and you can compare then this, uh, the speed of propagation of the waves by taking uh, this thing, this is about uh, 120 million light years from Earth, so divide 1.9 seconds divided by 120 million years, and the propagation speed for the gamma rays and the gravitational waves is the same to within that precision. It's an enormous precision. Uh, that, that was the first thing to get out. The opacity was su sufficiently high that, that, that uh, you, ha you had to tear things apart, uh, open it up sufficiently for the gamma rays to get out. Uh, and then it had to expand the stuff that was spewing off uh, uh, 
much of it was just held together in, in a proto-neutron star that may have impl probably imploded to form a black hole. But uh, the stuff that was spewing out had to expand enough uh, to have a large enough emitting surface area and low enough opacity to get the light out. And so this is a few days. Oh, Michael Silverstein from Chicago. Um, I, I was wondering when you showed us the two interferometers, one in Louisiana and the other at Hanford, Washington, whether that was um, that's those sightings, S-I-T-I-N-G-S, um, um, were based on physics, um, uh, uh, or were they based on other kinds of principles, and were they specifically oriented in particular ways, since they both look, they're both perpendicular mechanisms? Yeah. So. Uh, to as great an accuracy as possible, given the curvature of the Earth, they have parallel arms, so that they would see the same gravitational waveform. You see, there are two polarizations, which means two different waveforms, uh, and you wanted to see the same waveform in order to be sure you're seeing the same thing in this early era of the field. Uh, the choice of the sites, uh, the LIGO engineers uh, 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 went uh, under Robbie Volk. Uh, they uh, identified, uh, there was an international, a national competition, states uh, submitted proposals, you put a site here, you put a site there in my state, put a site here. Uh, these were all put, uh, the sites then were examined by LIGO uh, engineers uh, and they identified something like 19 acceptable site pairs. And then that set of 19 acceptable site pairs and all the technical data by, uh, about them were sent to uh, Washington to the National Science Foundation. The choice was made by Walter Massey, who was director of the National Science Foundation at that time. Uh, those of us in life can't help but suspect that there was some political uh, 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 <laughs> thought went into the choice, but it was Walter Massey's choice and not ours, but based on uh, all the data that we had put, that our team had put together and, and sent to Walter. Yes. Uh, David, David Tatel from Washington, D.C. That was totally fascinating. I have three quick questions. One, why are all these black holes colliding with each other? Two, will you get to the point, or are you there, where you can predict the collisions? And three, did the Big Bang issue a a gravity wave? Okay. So, uh, first, why are they colliding? Well, uh, more than half the stars in the universe are in binary systems. Binary systems are very common. Uh, and so uh, these uh, black holes conceivably, uh, they are as a result of the implosion to form a black hole of two stars that were originally in a binary system. If that's the case, for the, this to be true with black holes this heavy, these have to have been very old stars, stars, stars that were in the first generation of stars formed in the universe. Perhaps more likely, uh, these were formed as individual black holes, but in globular clusters of stars, in dense clusters of stars, and they sank to the center and found each other and formed binary pairs and spiraled together and merged. So there, there are these two uh, possible explanations, and we will understand which one it is when we have sufficient statistics about the properties of, of uh, the observed binary black holes. Uh, the second question was, uh, uh, are they predictable? Well, first you, have, uh, first you would have to see the two black holes by some other means, and you can only see them gravitationally. Uh, <laughs> And so you need a gravitational wave detector that which can see gravitational waves from at lower frequencies, such as LISA, uh, the space-based detector, and watch them spiral together at lower frequencies. And uh, as they spiral gradually together, emitting gravitational waves, you see them uh, go closer and closer together, higher and higher frequencies as emerge. So the only way to predict the specific ones is to catch it in a much earlier phase at lower frequency, and so you need very good low frequency coverage. And uh, well, we will not have that from the Earth because noise at low frequencies at the Earth prohibits us from operating on the Earth. You can only only do it from space. Uh, gravitational waves from the Big Bang. Uh, the key thing there is whatever came off of the Big Bang, according to theory, will have been amplified. I, t I told you it wouldn't be absorbed or scattered by matter. But they, we are fairly sure as cosmologists, theoretical cosmologists, with, with strong observational backing, 
So there was an early uh, phase of the universe called inflation in which the universe expanded extremely rapidly. And in that inflationary era, theory says that whatever came off of the Big Bang was amplified to form a rich spectrum of gravitational waves. Uh, and so, uh, and this, these primordial gravitational waves are uh, likely to be seen convincingly first with the fourth frequency band I talked about using uh, polarization of the cosmic microwave background. I won't go into the details. The, the sig that signal has already been seen, but it's confused with foreground noise uh, that, that is due to uh, polarization uh, from uh, dust, foreground dust. Uh, and so uh, what's required is to get good enough observations to remove the noise uh, get the signal out. That's likely to happen within the next decade, maybe sooner than that. We will have then the waves from inflation, uh, infl the inflationary uh, amplification of whatever came off the Big Bang, which is speculated to be nothing but vacuum fluctuations of the gravitational field, amplified in an inflation to form a rich spectrum of waves. That will likely, I think, be firmly seen by uh, this te other technique. Uh, and then in the 2040s, very likely by a follow-on mission to LISA, seeing it at much, seeing those uh, primordial gravitational waves at a much, much uh, higher uh, frequency than, uh, and so th at that point we will have the observations of gravitational waves from the earliest moments of the universe in two extremely different frequency bands, and it will just be very interesting to see uh, uh, those two sets of observations and whether they agree with standard theory or not. My personal guess is they will not, and, uh, and then uh, all hell will break loose in the theory community. <laughs> At least that's what I hope for. That's what I hope for. <laughs> Rich Schifrin? Yeah, <coughs> yeah, Rich Schifrin, Indiana. And I want to thank you. Wh and where are you? I can't. Oh, wait I'm sorry. Back here. Okay. Yeah. I want to thank you and the previous speaker and many of the speakers here because they really spark our sense of wonder. It's fantastic. And um, I guess in, I'm trying to image what's going on here. There are these gravitational waves coming in every possible direction continuously throughout the universe. And I'm wondering, one, f two questions. Really. One, do they interact at all? And secondly, if you increase this, the uh, sensitivity of the detectors, you'll start seeing all these crossing waves with each other. And then how do you unpack them? You'll need some kind of Fourier analysis or something to uh, figure out what's going on? Yeah, so I wish they interacted in interesting ways, but they're so weak, they just superpose uh, linearly, except when they're very near the source. The, uh, the one interesting nonlinear interaction would be if you uh, uh, have a black hole merger that creates a final black hole that's spinning quite rapidly, the waves that are being emitted are held in the grip of that very fast spinning black hole long enough for a nonlinear wave-wave interaction to occur and the prediction is that there will be some analog of turbulence, uh, two-dimensional turbulence, it turns out, uh, uh, that, that will influence the waveforms in very interesting ways. But we'll have to be very lucky to see that. So basically, without one exception, we expect no interaction between the waves. Um, the issue of overlapping signals is not an issue for LIGO at uh, the kinds of event rates that we expect to see over the next 20 years but it is a big issue for LISA. But we have the same kind of an issue uh, for your uh, television uh, receiver uh, uh, or for uh, a radio receiver. It's being, uh, being all the time bombarded by lots of emitted waves from different stations, and the receiver just tunes in to one station or another. In the same way this will be done with LISA, to tune in to uh, signals because you know, know, at least to the extent that you know what the signals are, you can identify a sig the strongest signal, remove it, then the next strongest signal, remove it, the next strongest signal, remove it. And uh, this has been done in uh, data analysis uh, tests uh, uh, by the LISA community, removing hundreds and hundreds of signals layer after layer after layer. But it's a major challenge in the data analysis because these signals are not uh, so uh, pure, purely monochromatic as uh, the carrier signals on television or radio transmission. So with that, I, 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 we have to close this session. But meanwhile, let us thank Dr. Trump.